Uh, Don Cobine. And what's the earliest hop festival you remember? Uh, 31, 32, and, 1930. Yeah. And what was it like down here then? Oh, you were here in the hop bowl? Yeah. Oh, wow. It was clear full of carnival. All around here, clear down, around. Um, of course, this was all back of the building here. The town was completely full of people. That's what I remember most of all, is just uh, lots of people promenaded around up and down the streets here. Was just thousands of people. Beer joints were all full. They were all completely full. People outside lined up. The old theater down the street here, the old list was, was uh, the set. The first and second showing both, people would be lined up for a block to get in the old movie. And uh, it cost us a nickel a piece to get in. Town was full of people cashing their hop tickets. It was quite a time. Oh, uh, all the old rides, Rod, you know, just had wrestling, Bulldog Jackson. <laughs> I worked with him on the river later. I remember watching him when I was a kid down there wrestling. The old rigs you hit with a hammer, you know, the old guys would be hitting that thing all the time. The cop camps would empty, you know, come to town. Horse Company was a big one, Wigridge Ranch, Whirline, Alluvial, all those uh, camps across the river, walkers, all the hop farms over there. They'd buy groceries with their tickets. And you could go in a beer joint and take a hop ticket, buy beer, whatever. But uh, the whole town, everybody accepted all the hop tickets, no matter where. You could always tell the, the car, the different colors. You could tell what ranch they were from, you know, like horse company, alluvial, or people working. It was a good time. The d depression was on. It was a hard time, but for a while, everybody had a little money, you know, for picking. They could buy groceries. Never seen anything like it after that. that. That went on, I remember them up to the 40, well, when the war started. I can remember all those from about 1931, 32, through all the 30s during the Depression up until World War II. Uh, and then the machines came in and they didn't need all the pickers, so it kind of faded away just faded away. Our hop festival went away. and Over the course of a number of decades, a number of other industries slipped away. The hops went, timber industry was in decline. Our downtown started slipping over a number of years. But then, at the beginning of the 2000s, we had a downtown renaissance. There was a new investment in our downtown in sidewalks and build-outs and repaving. Our community was investing in itself and businesses were looking up. And through all of this, there was a new energy that took place in our community. We decided to take a look at where we'd been, what we'd done, cheering for our heritage, and what could be there again. I was lucky enough to be able to recruit some really wonderful community leaders, people who wanted to get things done, and together they brought back the Hop Festival. The Hop Festival was a wonderful idea, and they put it to life. Now, when all of this was happening, there was a little bit of a backdrop. The downtown renovation was still underway. The road was not yet paved. They'd torn it up and replaced sewers and water underneath. And two days before the hop festival was slated to begin, we hadn't had the paving down. But the night before, our contractors were able to get the first layer of asphalt down so that the hop festival could take off. I think you also have to remember that in 2001, our event was scheduled in 2001, right after the September 11th bombings. And there was questions by some whether we should continue at all. But the committee and the folks in our community decided that we needed to celebrate what was good in America, the great things that we were really proud of. And so the Hop Festival went on. It was a wonderful event and one of the most touching moments was in downtown. There were hundreds, if not thousands of people down there when we kicked it off with somebody singing the national anthem. 
And with the backdrop of what had happened in New York and around the world, there was really a, a wonderful heart moving time that was just an unbelievable moment. An unbelievable moment in the all-American city named for what is really important in America, independence. It's a great place. It's a great festival. It, rec it recognizes what we have going in our community, and we're really proud of it. A year after our first hop festival, which was truly an unqualified success, despite the date that it came off on, we, uh, John mentioned having uh, some concerns about it being only 18 days after the 9-11 tragedy, but I want to expand just a moment on what he said when he came into the meeting right before the festival on the Tuesday after all of the, the uh, towers were bombed and all of that horrible stuff went on. He didn't come in and give us a rah-rah speech. He came in and said, if you stop this festival, the sons of bitches win. Don't let them win. And so we went ahead with the festival. The second year, in 2002, we started the Ghost Walk. And the Ghost Walk was started because there had been so many stories about downtown independence and houses and buildings and streets and alleyways that were, that were haunted that we decided it was time to capitalize on enjoying some of the nightlife other than the folks who came down and visited in downtown Independence. We did a little bit of advertising for the Ghost Walk. We expected, hope, I was hoping for about 30 or 40 people. I would have considered that a success. We had three places that were willing to be on the first Ghost Walk. There were no ghost hosts because we were just going to send our tiny group from one place to the next and let the host tell the stories, let the owners of the building tell the stories. Well, when I got downtown, there were a lot of people milling around, and I thought something must be going on. When I got to our first stop, which was the Masonic Lodge, there were, and we counted them later to make sure this was true, there were 310 people waiting to take the ghost walk. So I took half of them up into the Masonic Lodge, which filled it to capacity, talked to that group, sent a runner ahead to the next stop, who warned them that they were going to have a rather large group coming to hear their story, and another one following them. And that is the way we conducted the ghost walk on the first night. It is now going to be in its 11th year. We have a thousand people plus come to town for the ghost walk. It is still a free event. We now have 30 plus stops on the ghost walk. Some of them are historical, some of them are anecdotal, many are haunting stories. And I have to recruit a group of about 50 volunteers every year to help with this because it takes a lot of ghost hosts to, to take a thousand people around town. We, so far we've had mayors, we've had city councilors, we've had county commissioners who have been hosts for the ghost walk, we've had newspaper people, and I'm always looking for more. And if you see me sometime between, the, between July and September, probably my first words will be, what are you doing the last Friday in September? You're probably wondering what a ghoul like me is doing in a place like this. Come and find out at the annual Independence Ghost Walk. Specially trained host will take you through time to meet a few of us who visit you from there. If you don't have a crystal ball, visit us online. See you Friday night. Big fun. Big fun. We always have fun. Um, been doing it about seven years. Um, I've been here in Independence about 10, and uh, it's always a good crowd. Um, we get a little bit of everything in here, little kids, really old people, um, people from way far away as far as Seattle. I've had a couple of people from Seattle come down. Um, it's a great tour. Um, we've had to split it up into two different halves now, so that it's, uh, you know, if you go through one year, you might as well come back the next year and take the other half of the tour. Um, got some great history in here, some good ghost stories, and everybody has a good time. Thanks. And if you want to come on tour number three, let's go. Okay, can I sit? Do you mind if I sit? <laughs> go for it. Oh, okay. Do you want to... Uh... So, 
<clears throat> so the little girl, the story of the little girl, it, it comes over a, a whole long period of time. The first people that came to do any kind of paranormal investigation was Rain City Paranormal. Little local group, nice people. Um, and when they were in the building, they picked up on um, a little girl, a, a mean old man, and a pinched, a, a very a small, tight, pinched old lady. You know, like very proper. And um, so that kind of, ex oh, and they got an hour of footage of something moving downstairs. And I kept saying, wow, that looks like somebody's skipping, you know. Um, and I guess they didn't really pick up on the girl, that, uh, the people that at that time, the first time they came, we just got that, this movement footage. So the next time they came is when they picked up on all the, the, the three entities in the building. And then um, they came again, and that was when um, they actually heard, they got audio where um, they were sitting and talking, and, and the man said, uh, the mean old man, they're pretty sure said, you know, told him to get out. Mm -hmm. Get you could hear it, get out. It's like oh, so then um, the little girl. Um, some guy picked up on this little girl and and he said that she she was um, about six or seven, maybe eight, and that there was a doll in the building that she really loved and she was upset because she couldn't she couldn't get to it or she wasn't allowed to play with it or or if it was a room she couldn't go into or something like that. So, you know, if you fast forward, you know, about five years, um, these two ladies had come in one day and, and you know, most visitors will come in and, and they'll look at exhibits and they'll talk about them and stuff like that and they'll be together. Well, when people come in and they separate, it's like, okay, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> the side chicks. So they come in and they separated and, and they were telling me um, about more about the man. And, she, and I said, the mean old man? And she said, oh, no, he's not mean. He's irritated. Okay. He was, he was stationed somewhere or he was away somewhere for training and he, he was looking forward to coming back and taking some girl to a dance. And so I don't know, um, we still don't actually know if he took her to the dance or not, but she picked up on a nickname for him was of Barney. But we couldn't figure out, she couldn't pick up on the year that he was at war or where he was. So I'm waiting. I said, if it comes to you, call me back. So then um, and the other lady said, she was talking about the little girl and how she likes to play hide and seek and she's very playful. And, um, and then she started to leave and she goes, oh wait, I want to show you something. She goes, she loves this doll. And she goes and points at this, this doll in the pink dress in the parlor on the little rocking chair. And I said, oh my gosh, that makes perfect sense because she's not allowed to play in the parlor back in the old days. And those kinds of dolls were only made for older kids, you know, 18 years old, 16, 17, 18 years old. And they were just pretty to look at and they were usually made by an aunt or a grandma or something like that. So they were special to look at because they have porcelain hands, head and feet. And... Um, I can tell you by experience, if, if you're under the age of 16, you're going yeah. to break them. Yeah. So anyway, so that, that helped a lot. And so more about the little girl. <clears throat> a boy was in here one day talking to me in the office, like I started out talking about. And, she, and he said that, or as he was talking to me, he was looking down the hallway, down to where like I keep my coffee pot and stuff. And he was kind of looking, he goes, oh, whoa. And I said, what? And he says, I saw the little girl. She was looking right at me, and then she realized I could see her, and she and she ducked back. So she kind of ducked this way, and so he kind of walked back there, and he said, "Man, she's she's good at hiding." And so he was kind of walking around in here, and he and he said he felt her touch him, come up behind him and touch him, and then he turned around and he said he couldn't he couldn't sense her or see her anywhere. So he had a lot of fun. He said she is so good at hiding, and she's so playful. So he picked up on. Um, that her name, he picked up on Isabel, so we don't know if that's really her name, but Isabel came to him, um, that I, that she's very playful, she's got a sad aura around her, and, um, I asked him if he knew, you know, what happened to her, because she was so little, and he said that she, she was terminally sick, and, um, 
she's very respectful and mature for her age, and she's loving and caring. So that was kind of cool. Then he went and wandered around in the military room, and that's where Barney hangs out. And um, he was standing in the doorway in between the two exhibits, and he and he said, "I can I can feel him behind me." And he says he's somebody who's important, you know, higher up in rank than just a an infantryman. And and he, then he said, he says, "I'm really grateful for what you did for us while you served our country. Thank you." And he said that's when he felt the guy kind of relax, mm -hmm. because f first he felt this this kind of irritated authority and, and he said the guy kind of relaxed after that but and then he got then he got kind of got creeped out and then left he says oh like you know because that never happened to him before he said but the little girl that that's kind of a, a cool one wow. and the old lady I've been really um, I only kind of experienced things with her a couple of times I she's very proper and wants everything done right and you know, if you're a lady, you're supposed to act like a lady. And, and so those two times I didn't act like a lady, I decided I wasn't going to do that anymore. And so she, we haven't had any, any altercations since then. And the windows over on the side. And I think the reason they don't put them in these front windows anymore is because that's where they uh, jumped from. There's one. Is there one up there now? Yep. Yeah. In, that, in the round windows in front? No. Okay. It was out of these two rounded out windows that two mannequins fell to their demise. <laughs> yeah, like the doll mannequin. Huh? Well, I don't know, and I used to tell that with a little bit of a jokiness, you know, the mannequins jumped and they fell, and because I figured someone had pushed them. And two years ago, we were standing on that this corner, and I was telling that story, and a lady across the street left her group long enough to come over and say, wait, wait, wait. It's true. I was standing there when they jumped. And she said, I watched them come out, and there was nobody behind them pushing them. Well, I don't know what to say. Somebody witnessed it. There are seven varieties of hops that are planted here. And you see the hop cones are mostly towards the top of the trellis system. And as somebody who's uh, tall, if you go pick about five or six hop cones off of one of these tall pieces, be careful because hops are stickery. They're related to a nettle. And about half of the population is allergic to hops in its natural form because the vines have tiny little pokey things on them that have a toxin in them. I happen to know a couple of stories if you're willing to let me tell them. This house that, we're, that I'm standing in front of used to be over on the corner where the cinema is now. It was moved here. The man who bought this house bought it for only $500, which is pretty cheap for a house. However, by the time he had moved it over here, it cost him as much as a regular house. And they had to move this house very, very carefully because they did not want to lose the big tree that's up here. And they also had to work it underneath the power lines. So it took a long time to jiggle it right into the right space. And acro also across the way, there used to be a hop warehouse where they processed hops here. And the train used to come right down that track and stop and pick up bales of hops that they processed. There is a little girl that visits this house. And she has been seen bouncing a ball or jumping rope. She is usually upstairs. I just was listening to the tail end of a casual story that was being told inside. And there was a lady who visited here who is, uh, she said she's very, very aware of ghosts because she always gets a headache in one spot. And she came here once to eat. And she was rubbing her head, rubbing her head, and they came back and asked if she was okay. And she said, I get a headache whenever there's a ghost, and I've got that headache now. And she's not been back because it was, uh, it was too hard on her, I guess. But... 
How many times have we heard things about children in ghost stories so far? A lot. A lot? A lot. Mostly about what? Little girl. girl. Little girl. Boy. And little boy. boy. And the little girl. Let me tell you where that came from. Do you know where Main Street Antiques is? Yeah. Okay. Main Street Antiques was the first business downtown to be uh, upgraded. And it really looks beautiful now. But that was the first place where there was really some intense activity. To the point where the man that owns Main Street Antiques made a deal with a ghost. And he said, when I'm upstairs where he lives, you have to be downstairs. And when I'm downstairs, you have to be upstairs. And the ghost apparently agreed to it because he didn't have any more trouble with any interference in his sleep or anything else. But it seems that once he told the ghost that he needed to be downstairs at night, it sort of let him out to go up and down the street. And once that happened, that little boy has been seen all over the place. And I would recommend that you go into uh, Raging River sometime and have dinner and ask the owner there about the little boy. And they will tell you about the red ball that bounces in and out of the building. I just heard today that the little boy apparently was, I guess you could say, made into a ghost when he was hit by a car chasing his little ball across the street. Kind of sad, isn't it? In the speakeasy that we were standing in front of, if you look online about paranormal and speakeasy, you'll see a picture that was taken of the little girl. And she is uh, reflected in the window there, holding on to her little stuffed animal. We don't know what happened to her, but I believe uh, Peggy was telling us that they thought it was some kind of a disease that took her. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is now 10 minutes after 9. You've been ghost walking for an hour and 40 minutes, and we're about to the end of what we can tell you. I'm so sorry. I can't go on a little more. My voice is going to wear out. Mine isn't. <laughs> I thank you for joining me, and I thank so many of you for sticking with me tonight. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed it. Come back next year because the stories are growing all the time. Or we might ditch Nice work. Thank you. One of the very first paranormal groups that was here, there was a, um, an assessment made that uh, a young man sitting in the big chair right up here, what? you, that there's supposed to be a female entity who lives over in, around, or near that chair because that's the east of the, the Sonic Lodge and he probably told you that's usually the seat of power or where the, where the uh, head uh, person in the organization sits and she was happy with being here and she liked being in the seat of power. So you're probably sitting on a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to tell you one story. One story about a house that we passed down here. It says, I'm not sure which house, but it's on B Street between the museum and Moodhart. Sorry, we're first. Flag. Flag. Yes, record the back of There's a head. house down there that, that uh, has been haunted for many years, and it's haunted by a ghost named Jeffrey. And Jeffrey has but one talent. He levitates the VCR. And Grandma, who lives in the house, or did live in the house, and Jeffrey, were, were, they had made an agreement to get along together. But when the grandkids came over, he thought it was pretty funny to levitate the VCR, and so the grandkids would come in and the VCR would be... Does everybody know what a VCR is? Yeah. Uh, it would be sitting about eight inches above the TV, just hovering there. And the kids would call Grandma, and Grandma would come out and say, Jeffrey, put that down, and it would go down very slowly. He didn't drop things, but he just lifted it up and down. We do not know whether Jeffrey is still there, and if he has the same talent with DVD players, <laughs> or, or what, Blu-rays, or TiVo, or any of that stuff. 
who you are and what you're doing here. And this is our director, Teresa. Hello. Um, I'm the graphic designer and photographer, Patrick, and this is uh, one of our IT members, Amanda. We are at Oregon Society. Oh. I'll leave it to the director to speak. <laughs> this is actually our first year hosting the Ghost Tour. We're really excited. It's a huge opportunity for us. Um, basically, we're just going to help lead the tours around through town, talk about some history and some of the ghost stories that go with them. Um, we did a bunch of uh, investigations around here, so we'll be talking about our own experiences. We did the Raging Rivers, we did the Elks Club over there. Um, we did a couple. We have Indy Pizza lined up. We have uh, a few residentials. We did the Heritage Museum. Oh, yeah. Thank you, if, if you're interested in about Oregon Ghost Society or a bit more, uh, you can go to OregonGhostSociety.com and uh, give all our information and actually got a few postcards to hand out to. Do you have Facebook here? We do. Oh, yeah. We are on Facebook. Good. Okay. That's us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just Oregon Ghost Society on Facebook? Yep. Yes. OregonGhostSociety.com. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. No, I'll actually give you Oh, yeah. uh, just informational, I guess. My name is Mike Gambino. I'm from OFER. Uh, OFER stands for the Occult and Paranormal House of Investigational Research. Uh, we're based out of Salem, Oregon, but we travel to where everybody needs us. Uh, conduct paranormal investigations on all levels, not just ghosts, but claims of uh, cryptids, you know, like uh, Bigfoot sightings and whatnot, uh, alleged UFO sightings, abductions. All sorts of fun stuff. Um, if anybody out there needs us, you can contact us through the website. That's www.teamofer. That's T-E-A-M-O-P-H-I-R.com. Thank you. What is it about? Are you doing a ghost host tour this time? We are. Okay. We are. What's the documentary about? Is it just about this event? About the hot festival. It's about the hot festival? Yeah. Are, are you, you being a ghost host too? I am. This is Bernard Powell. He's going to be a, yeah. a ghost host this time around. So is this your first time doing something? This is my first time hosting a tour, yeah. We, we came out here last year, though. We've been out here year after year, but never in an official capacity. So we're going to really enjoy it this time. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. There's, we, this festival is about heritage, it's about remembering where we came from, but it's also about celebrating what we are. And this is a place where a lot of young business people have started out, have just begun and have taken their first plunge. There's an entrepreneurial spirit. And whether that was from the 1840s when people came on the covered wagons or people that came in the last few years that have moved in here from other parts of the world, this is a place where you can be successful and it's a warm and friendly enough community that you know wraps your arms, the collective community arms around you. And it's a place where people can, can really be successful. It's a place where you can raise your family and be proud of it. It's a place where, you know, everybody loves being able to do something that you can't, you can't live in a big city. You don't have a cookie eating contest. You don't have a pie contest. You don't have a critter parade. You don't see the Cub Scouts selling hot dogs and popcorn. This is the kind of place that people love to come to. You know, they think, you think that only communities like this only live in a Norman Rockwell painting, but we really live here. This is how things are. People know each other here. And if you're out of money or you forgot your wallet in the car, the business owners are gonna say, pay me when you come back in, pay, you know, take care of it, and we know where you are. This is that type of a community, and I'm really proud of that. And it's, the Hop Festival is, is our celebration. It's celebrating what we are, and um, it is the all-American community. You know, John, I read, uh, I, I've been perusing historic newspapers, 
and I read one that talked about how independence did its road work in the early days. This was from about 1910. And what they did was when the roads needed to be serviced, they declared road work day, all the businesses closed down, and every able-bodied male from 16 and above came out and worked on the roads for the day, and it was done. That's right. I think that spirit is still here. Yes, it is. 